Okay, thank you. And sharing. Okay. Oops. Still something wrong. This one. Yep. Okay, can you see the slides? Somebody say yes or no? Yeah. Okay, good. So let us get started. So we started to have this rather weird discussion, namely that what is the classical limit I mean in the quantum field theory? So we are used to the idea that we start with classical mechanics and we introduce canonical quantization condition to go to quantum mechanics. And we already have, the, what the, uh, we already have learned what the quantum field theory means. So now we are asking the backwards question, what the classical limit of the quantum field theory actually is. And I told you already that the answer turns out to be this Bose-Einstein condensate. So we have this uh, Lagrangian for quantum field theory. And uh, we decided to take the chemical potential to be positive, which means the potential is negative. And then we look at this situation that uh, for each particle you actually put into the system, you actually gain energy. And that is kind of thing you want when you want to study a system with repulsive forces among each other. And that's what you are verifying in the current homework problem. So once you have this last term here, the particles repel with each other. And especially when system is very cold, then the system wants to sort of spit out particles because that's the way uh, 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 you would like to minimize the repulsive energy. But thanks to this additional uh, positive chemical potential, you also gain energy by putting more particles into the system. So that's how you can have an equilibrium where you have certain number of particles, like we're talking about thousands to millions actually, despite the fact that there is this uh, uh, repulsive potential. And because we're looking for the classical limit of it, we study the order Lagrange equation. So this is what we have done uh, on Wednesday. In general, we cannot solve this equation, but there are special cases where we can. And one case is sort of trivial, where Psi just identically vanishes. So every term in this equation is just zero. But there's a less, slightly less trivial solution where Psi is still space-time constant so that you can ignore these derivative terms but you can balance the last two terms against each other to make sure that that actually vanishes, where psi modulo squared is given by chemical potential over this coupling of the repulsive potential. So that is an exact solution to this order Lagrange equation. Now, you can ask the question, which one is more appropriate for us? And for, to answer that question, we looked at the Hamiltonian, which is just a negative of the thing in this yellow box. So this is actually the Hamiltonian now, now that uh, we uh, uh, don't have the derivative of psi because it's space-time constant. So this is now the Hamiltonian. And then we can see how this function looks like on the complex plane of the complex variable of psi. So here's a real axis, here's the imaginary axis, and on top of this complex plane, I plotted this function here. And you have seen this already. Uh, so at the origin, it vanishes, but you have negative coefficient for the quadratic term. So from the origin, the potential starts to go down. But once psi becomes large enough, then quadratic term always wins because of the higher power compared to quadratic term. So potential turns around and, and become larger again. So that develops a minimum somewhere in between. And also because this is a function of the modulus of psi, absolute value of psi, that's the real part squared plus an imaginary part squared, it depends only on the distance from the origin, and therefore potential is rotationally or axially symmetric, uh, rotating around the z-axis. So that's how you understand this form of the potential. And now that if you bring in a ball and put that at the origin, then this, in principle, can stay there forever in classical mechanics, uh, unless there's some fluctuation that jiggles the balls around, then the sitting at the origin is indeed a solution of the equation of motion. But you clearly see that this is an unstable solution. If you just uh, 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 nudge it just a tiny bit, it starts to roll down the hill and settle at this uh, one of the minima. And you see there are actually infinite number of minima around this uh, at the bottom of this potential. So it settles down somewhere. So as a result, this seems to be a more appropriate uh, uh, solution to look at. And if you just take the square root of this, 
size given by square root of mu over lambda, but it can have an arbitrary phase because this phase disappears when you take the absolute square. So this phase represents where the minimum can be anywhere along this bottomless potential. So on the complex plane of the real axis and imaginary axis, the phase e to the i theta corresponds to the angle in this direction. And so this is the solution for any theta you like. So there's an infinite number of solutions of this type uh, solving the Euler-Lagrange equation. And once you have the solution, we can actually also go to a different reference frame by performing Galilean transformation. So this solution basically corresponds to the gas of atoms sitting at rest. But if you go to a different reference frame, then you are looking at the gas of atoms sitting at rest from your reference frame that's moving relative to it. So from your point of view, this looks like it's a gas of atoms moving together in a flow. So going to the new reference frame, then we know how Galilean transformation works. We studied that last uh, uh, on Wednesday. So by doing the transformation, you do this transformation. And for our purpose, psi is just a constant, so it's very simple. So it ends up, in, it ends up being this form over here. So now you have a solution which depends on space and time. But because of the fact that the Lagrange equation is covariant under the Galilean transformation, it is guaranteed also an exact solution, and that's easy to verify, and that is going to be part of your next homework problem. If you stick in this solution to this order Lagrange equation, the time derivative will pull out half mv squared, spatial derivative will pull out mv, and together with this prefactor, you are just basically saying that half mv squared is the same as half mv squared. So that's how you see the first two terms balance against each other. And the third and fourth terms uh, has to do with taking the absolute square of psi here and putting them together. So just the condition that uh, this is at the bottom of the potential is already good enough to show that this is actually zero as well. So first and second term balance against each other, third and fourth terms cancel against each other so that this equation motion is satisfied. So this is yet another special case where we can solve this nonlinear differential equation exactly. And there's also a physical meaning to it because if you remember, psi like a psi integrated over the entire space is the number operator of particles. So psi like a psi has a meaning of the number density. So the prefactor here ends up having the meaning of the square root of number density together with this uh, plane wave factor. So that's a definite solution to the Euler Lagrange equation uh, coming from this Lagrangian. Okay, let me stop here, uh, then pause uh, for some questions. Well, you've seen this already on Wednesday, so maybe uh, not that many questions, but you know, I, I nonetheless ask for, uh, I'll wait for that. Everything okay? All right. And you have seen this video too, but it's such a fun, so let me show this again. So what was that kind of space supposed to be about? So at high temperature, all these atoms are moving fast. And you start to cool the system. And these fast moving atoms correspond to some of these excited states on this chart. But as you cool the system, they start to come down to low and low energy levels. And size of each wave function grows because being slow means low momentum. Low momentum means low wavelength. And then eventually start to open up with each other. And this is also what I have shown you on Wednesday. And uh, people have done this experiment using rubidium atom. And rubidium, rubidium is one of the alkaline elements. So you have one free valence electron in S orbital. And all the other orbitals uh, at the lower levels are all occupied in their closed shells. And the reason why this atom is actually useful is that because of this isolated single uh, valence electron, an electron has a magnetic moment. 
when you actually apply magnetic field to the system, and that basically creates a potential uh, to the atoms. And so by shaping the form of the magnetic field appropriately, you can produce basically parabolic potential, like in a harmonic oscillator, to trap these atoms. And, and then you can start to see how this system would cool and eventually form a macroscopic number of the atoms occupying zero momentum state. So this is the plane of Px and Py. So this is a momentum space in x and y directions. The fact that you have this big blob at the center means that you have this macroscopic number of atoms all occupying the zero momentum state. And so that's the idea of Bose-Einstein condensate. And I told you already that uh, you can let two Bose-Einstein condensates to overlap with, with each other. And so each Bose-Einstein condensate consists of thousands or even millions of atoms. And, and, but they, when they overlap, they actually show this fringe pattern. And that's an evidence that both of these Bose-Einstein condensates actually behave like a classical wave. So that's a demonstration that the macroscopic number of atoms together would behave as if that whole collection is a classical wave of some sort. And that's the weird thing about Bose-Einstein condensate. So let me stop here and if you have any questions. Is everything okay? All right, and we can be more quantitative about this. So this fringe pattern is basically the variation in number densities. And so this is actually a picture of uh, the, uh, the data uh, by uh, shining light on the system. Uh, this uh, zigzag curve shows the absorption probability of the uh, light you have shown on this uh, system. And this zigzag means that you have high density, low density, high density, low density, variation in density over this uh, uh, range of the, 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 uh, 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 of the system. And this is what corresponds to the fringe pattern you saw on the previous slide. But if you don't have two Bose-Einstein condensate overlapping with each other, you basically have this sort of Gaussian shaped blob. There's no zigzag going on there. Only when two of them overlap, you have this zigzag. Uh, uh, so that's the fringe pattern of two classical waves. And so these gentlemen uh, received a Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001. Is that about the time when you were born? I guess. So, uh, uh, but you know, in the history of physics, that's fairly recent. You, uh, you need to understand that. So this Bose-Einstein condensate of cold dilute gas of atoms is a relatively recent discovery. And that's because people had to do a rather uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, immense technological uh, uh, advancement to be able to produce a system like this because you have to go to incredibly low temperature for this. But anyway, so let us just verify that interference of two waves, we have the obtained these solutions already, would actually produce this, this fringe pattern. So I have this solution, so I use two of them. So one, psi one, has square root n one, and specific velocity is v one. Second one, psi two, has the number that's the n two, and another velocity v2 over here. And if you actually sum them up, then you find this result. So this one squared would give you n1. This one squared would give you n2. Then you have the cross terms. The cross term has, of course, square root of n1 times square root of n2. And then you have product of the plane wave factors, and one of them is complex conjugated. So using this solution for v1, and using the complex conjugate of the solution V2, effectively what you do is to subtract V1 from V2. So in this expression, this V is meant to be relative velocity. So this is the way you can see that you have this uh, cosine variation uh, in space, and that's the zigzag you have seen in the data on the previous slide. So uh, I would like to emphasize that this Psi 1, Psi 2 are definitely not wave functions on two accounts. First of all, if they were wave functions, then each measurement would collapse the entire system to the position eigenstate. So you have to keep repeating the same measurements over and over again until you can see the fringe pattern. And that's what you have seen, for example, in double slit experiment, right? But this time, you just shine the light and then you see this zigzag pattern all at once. 
So this is not quantum mechanical wave function. This is a classical wave you can measure as a whole by single measurement. So that's one reason why this is definitely not a, a usual quantum mechanical wave function. Another reason is that this is the multi-body system of thousands of atoms. And the wave function has to be a function with arguments, each of which correspond to the position of uh, one of these atoms. So it's a huge function that has something like a uh, three times thousand coordinates inside uh, the other uh, function. But this is not that. This is a function of just space and only single spatial position, not thousands of them. So based on these two reasons, this psi should not be looked at as a wave function. But rather, this is actually a classical limit of the field we've been talking about. And it's a field because it's a function of space and time. And, and that means this is actually a classical wave. So this is actually a very strange thing that you have these thousands of atoms interacting with each other with positive potential, and you're cooling the system without an incredibly low temperature. But after cooling it down, this collection of particles will start to uh, behave as if this whole system is a classical wave. So from the point of view of standard quantum mechanics, this is a highly quantum phenomenon. Macroscopic number of uh, quantum objects behave collectively as a classical wave. On the other hand, from the point of view of the quantum field theory, the quantum field theory describes multi-particle system as you have been going through in your uh, past two homework problems. So now you know that is the case, but quantum field theory can also describe physics when you take a classical limit where the classical wave actually represents this highly quantum state of matter. And sometimes you see this name in the literature to call this psi as a macroscopic wave function. But you know now that's a wrong name. That's a misnomer because it's not a wave function. But you can sort of see why people might want to call it because you're talking about macroscopic number of particles, hence macroscopic. And it looks as if it is sort of like wave function because this follows a similar equation as a Schrodinger equation. But now you know it's also nonlinear, so it's definitely not Schrodinger equation, but it looks similar. You also now know the reason why they look similar because both Schrodinger equation and this field equation have to be invariant under Galilean transformation. And that's why they both look similar uh, with a combination of time derivative and spatial derivative squared. So you know all these reasons by now. So now you see why this is a wrong name to use. But just in case that you might come across this uh, terminology in reading papers, what they actually mean is this classical limit of the quantum field. So this is how you can really understand this zigzag behavior of the two bosons in condensate using the exact solutions we have gotten for the Euler-Lagrange equation in quantum field theory. Okay, let me stop here and pause again if there are any questions. Uh, I just wanted to quickly ask, yeah, go ahead. was there a reason for the particular onslaughts of having a constant psi, or is that just an easy solution? Yeah, it, it, so th this is definitely the idealization, right? Because this is, uh, if you take absolute squared, that's constant in space and time. And the real Bosanian condensate have been produced by uh, creating a trap. So it's inside a potential, and so it has a sort of Gaussian-like shape in it. So this is definitely an idealization. But in order to solve this Euler-Lagrange equation in the presence of both. Sorry. I'm trying to get the Euler-Lagrange equation in, in the presence of this, uh, the interaction term. Uh, and this is a nonlinear equation. So you can even use a superposition pr principle to obtain new solution out of two solutions. And in general, this is very difficult to solve. Numerically, it's, it's not that hard. So once you're given the solution, and you can also put in this external potential, if you like, with this potential well from this magnetic field, then you can go ahead and solve for the solution uh, uh, together with the external potential and this uh, uh, interaction term as well. So it's not a difficult problem numerically, 
but because I'd like to show you how things work uh, on basically the blackboard or slides on a piece of paper or whatever. Uh, that's why I wanted to specialize it to sort of the idealized situation of the space-time constant solution without any external potential acting on it. And uh, the, we have this uh, boring solution, which is just purely constant. But we also generalize this a little bit to, by going to an arbitrary reference frame so that we at least have this exact solution which corresponds to this moving Bose-Einstein condensate. So the fact that two Bose-Einstein condensates are moving with the relative velocity is what's causing the interference uh, pattern as you saw on the last slide. So uh, this is at least generic enough for purposes to understand the origin of the fringe pattern. So once again, this is not general enough actual situation is more complicated. You have to resort to numerical uh, solution to the differential equation, but the, for the purpose of understanding why you expect to see the fringe pattern when two Bose-Einstein condensates overlap, this solution turned out to be general enough, and that's why I'm using that solution. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So uh, we have now gotten to this origin of the fringe pattern by looking at the solutions to the classical Euler-Lagrange equation. And here is a reminder that this solution can be understood as the coherent state we have studied in harmonic oscillator. And in the case of a harmonic oscillator, the coherent states correspond to slightly uncertain n, and n is the level of the excited states, but rather well-defined phase. And now that we are dealing with the quantum field theory rather than the harmonic oscillator, now you know n corresponds to the number of atoms in the system. So number state has a definite number of atoms. So in our case, you have two bose einstein condensate, and total number of atoms is clearly a fixed number. However, when you look at the number of atoms in each of the condensate, because every atom is an identical boson, they can sort of freely move whether they belong to the first condensate or second condensate. So n1, n2 each can be actually uncertain. And because n1 minus n2 can be uncertain, correspondingly, the relative phase between the condensates, theta1 minus theta2, can be certain to a certain degree. Pun not intended. But anyway, so you can have this somewhat well-defined relative phase between two condensates. And the relative phase is what's really causing this fringe pattern, as you saw on the previous slide. So that's really what's going on here. So as a matter of fact, this bose einstein condensate described by this classical wave corresponds to the coherent state if you build a Hilbert space. And coherent state is coherent, namely that it can have this rather well-defined phase, and at the expense of making the number somewhat uncertain. And this number phase uncertain principle is really manifested in this system. And the coherence is what it makes the, uh, the bose einstein condensate behave like a classical wave. And they interfere and shows the fringe pattern. And ultimately, origin of that has to do with the fact that relative number of the two condensates can be uncertain because the atoms can move back and forth between two condensates. Okay, this is uh, just a little conceptual point about this. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Everything clear? You, okay, um, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, because we've had the coherent state in the harmonic oscillator system mm -hmm. kind of correspond to more classical, mm -hmm. like our classical expectations in here right. again as well. So right. is that like a general rule because of this kind of definite phase property that they right. end up recreating kind mm -hmm. of the classical limit of the system? That, that's right. So okay. if you remember the way we introduced this idea of coherent state is that to mimic classical pendulum, we want to have both X and P specified within the uncertain principle. So having both X and Y specified was achieved by having an eigenvalue of the annihilation operator, because annihilation operator is roughly speaking X plus IP. So eigenvalue, which is complex, of the annihilation operator tells you that real part corresponds to X 
imaginary part corresponds to P, so that you have both X and P specified to the extent that the Mr. Heisenberg wouldn't be mad at us. So now that you have both X and P, that mimics this classical pendulum, especially when this blob is away from the origin. So we are dealing with the same situation. The Psi is annihilation operator. Now we are talking about eigenstate of the annihilation operator, where you have N times E to the I theta is the annihilation operator. So now you have both N and theta specified to a certain degree. So that's how you can have more or less well-defined number, but it's a little bit uncertain. And then you have also more or less well-defined phase, phase, which is also a little bit uncertain, allowed by this uncertainty principle. But when the number of particles is macroscopic, thousands and millions, even if you allow, say, uncertainty by a couple, this is a big number. So the theta can be extremely well-defined, and hence you can observe this coherence of the waves in fringe pattern very, very clearly in experiments. Thank you for asking the question, Anna. Yeah, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, any further questions on this? And I forgot to mention something very important. Uh, so this, uh, uh, there, there, there are three people who got uh, Nobel Prize uh, and shared a Nobel Prize. And Wolfgang Kettley worked at MIT. Uh, Eric Corden and Carl Weimer worked in University of Colorado and uh, NIST. Uh, uh, in, in Boulder. And the work done by Wolfgang Kettley, as you see in his reference here, is of course multi-order paper. And this DM kern is our own uh, Stamper kern, Dan Stamper kern in a department. So he was postdoc in the group. So I kind of suspect it was he who made this observation possible. So, you know, too bad that he didn't share the Nobel Prize. But anyway, so he contributed a lot to this experiment, as far as I know. So uh, uh, that's the way you might also appreciate being in the physics department here in Berkeley. We got a lot of great people. So let me finish this up. So now just recap what we have done. So there's always this duality between wave and particle in quantum systems. And what we used to do in quantum mechanics is treat particles as a classical objects. Then you say you quantize your Lagrangian Hamiltonian and get to quantum theory where you see wave equation following the Schrodinger equation. So that's what you have done many, many times over in quantum mechanics class in 137. What we are doing here is basically the opposite. In quantum field theory, you take the classical object, which is a wave, and wave is a function of space and time, hence a field. Then you quantize it. And also quantizing it, now you, as you do in the homework problem, you get the multi-particle quantum mechanical states. So the role of particle and wave are the opposite. And the reason why doing quantum mechanics was the natural thing to do is because we perceive atoms as the tiny particles. And that's something we can picture in our head. And then it's a surprise to us that those tiny particles actually behave like a wave following the Schrodinger equation. So starting with the particles and going to wave later is kind of a natural thing for us to do. And starting the wave of this boson condensate is definitely not a natural thing for us because you know, we haven't seen this until 1995. So the human beings have known this only for the last 25 years. But if you imagine a creature that is living in nano Kelvin world, so you were born to that world, then everything around you is a Bose-Einstein condensate. So you see these classical waves all the time. So if you do live in that kind of world, you will be very surprised <coughs> that once you're actually going up to higher temperature, higher energies, you can knock out individual particles out of this classical wave, right? you will be very surprised to see that. So you might build a large hadron collider in this nano Kelvin world, inject enormous amount of energy into the collision point, then out comes particles and you go, what? We only have known waves. So it just depends on your perspective in what kind of experience you have in a daily life, it, simply because we are much more used to particles in daily life, going from particle to wave was the first step we took when we start to talk about the quantum physics. <clears throat>
But if you had lived in this imaginary world in nano Kelvin, that everything around you is the classical waves because they are condensates, then finding a particle would be a huge surprise to you. And that's exactly what we do in quantum field theory. You start with a classical wave, you quantize it, and you find particles. And, and then you are talking about, again, this particle wave duality, just in the opposite order. So that's just a conceptual point to just to recap what we have done. Uh, any questions about this idea? Everything okay? All right. And one thing actually I learned recently is that the International Space Station actually has a lab that produces the Bose-Einstein condensate in zero gravity environment. And the reason why I want to do this is that, let's say you do make this Bose-Einstein condensate that takes a lot of work with a lot of technology, but once you actually release it, then what happens is that it just drops because there's gravity. And these atoms are moving so slowly that gravity is just enough to pull them down. In normal life, when we have the, the air around us, this made of tiny molecules, as you all know, and they are not uh, dropping to the bottom of the room, right? And do you know why that is? Any volunteers? Why don't all the air molecules drop on the floor? Um, it's thermal energy. Or it's Good. That's exactly right. So we live in a high temperature space. So every molecules are moving because of the thermal energies dictated by the uh, equipartition theorem. And, and that speed or kinetic energy is far, far bigger compared to the gravitational potential energy. So half mv squared is much, much bigger than mgh. That's why you can breathe. Air it can come into your lungs and otherwise you will be all dead by now. So that's why air molecules don't drop on the floor. But once you go to this nano Kelvin temperature, that each particle is moving so slowly, the Bose-Einstein condensate just start to drop. So precious condensate you work so hard to produce will be lost. But in zero gravity environment, it just stays there <coughs> and you can manipulate it. You've got much longer time to play with it. So that's part of the reason why they are doing this experiment in a zero gravity environment. But you still have to come up with a way of cooling the gas of atoms to nano Kelvin temperature. And, and because they, NASA is doing this on, on the International Space Station, they produce really cool video uh, to tell you how they actually cool the gas of atoms down to this incredibly low temperature of nano Kelvin. So this is the picture of this, uh, what they call the cold atom laboratory, short CAL, C-A-L, kind of confusing for us, right? You know, go bears. Uh, anyway, this is the cold atom laboratory sitting right on the International Space Station. And this is what they do to cool the system down to the temperature. That's kind of crazy to Can you think hear the sound? that you make something cold by okay. shining light on it. <clears throat> Normally we think about shining light on something and making it hot. Laser cooling does something quite counterintuitive. It makes something cold by shining light on it. Temperature is about motion. The molecules in the air in this room are moving really fast, about 300 meters per second. If you cool down a gas, you're making the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And getting to the lowest possible temperatures, that's the extreme that we're trying to go to on Cal, and we learn something new when we go to those extremely low temperatures. We start with atoms that are actually room temperature, even a little bit hotter than room temperature. We just have a vapor of them in a glass cell where we use the radiation pressure from lasers to slow down atoms. As it turns out, light pushes on stuff. We don't feel it when we walk out in the sunlight, but for something as light as an atom, the push that you can exert by shining light on the atom, in our case, laser light, can be really significant. We don't actually use two lasers, we actually use six. So there's two this way, two vertical, two in and out. And so no matter which way the atom's moving, it's always moving towards one of the lasers and that causes it to slow down. 
and cools them down to one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. But eventually, to get to the temperatures that we need for Cal, we actually have to turn off the lasers. And what we do is we move the atoms so that they're held by magnetic forces. And what we can do now is we can just adjust the magnetic field so that this trap that they're held in is not very deep. So we can make it so that the most energetic atoms just have enough energy to just move off and escape when they fly away. We can actually pull out just the hot atoms, leaving the rest of them at a colder temperature. This is called evaporative cooling. It's essentially the same as when you blow on your coffee cup. The hottest molecules make it out of the water, and if you can constantly be blowing those away, you can cool down your coffee. And that gets us all the way down to these temperatures of microkelvin, a millionth of a degree above absolute zero. But it turns out you can get even colder by using another really old trick called adiabatic expansion. If you take any gas and you expand it, it'll get colder. So we're doing the same thing on a sort of small scale. We have this little small sample of atoms that are confined by magnetic fields. Uh, and what we're doing is we're reducing the strength of that magnetic field, which lets the atoms expand out something like a factor of a thousand, which causes them to cool off by a factor of a thousand. This trick works so well, we get down to temperatures below one nanotemp, one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. And it's being done on the Cold Atom Laboratory every day. Isn't that cool? So one thing I realized that now we are stuck with this online teaching, I can show videos, which I can do in the classroom. So there's some benefits to that. Okay, so uh, the, you know this idea that uh, the cold atoms start to behave like a classical wave, I hope that started to sink into your mind now. But we can test this idea much more rigorously and quantitatively. And the way you do it is look for something called elementary excitations. So once you have a system <clears throat> which is very cold, the next question you always ask, which is true in condensed matter physics, particle physics, nuclear physics, in, in any of these systems, you ask the questions, what are the possible excited states about the ground state you got? And the way you answer this question in <coughs> uh, the quantum mechanics is that you solve for the, uh, the energy eigenstates of Schrodinger equation and, and, and first build a ground state and ask the question, what is the next uh, the excited state and so on and so forth. But now that we have a description of the system using a classical field, the way you can answer this question is a lot simpler, it turns out. So all you do is again, <coughs> go back to the basics. We have this chemical potential. We have this energy gain for ad adding an additional particle. And we have this order Lagrange equation. So because classical physics is all dictated by the equation of motion, it should be same here. Now that we have this classical order Lagrange equation, that should be able to tell us everything we wanna know. So how do we go up with about next to study it? Again, we're facing this problem that we can't solve this equation exactly, but we do have a solution we'd like to start with. So it, the quantum analogy is that this would be basically the ground state, and now you're looking for the excited states on top of it. The way you answer this question classically is that, okay, this is a solution, exact solution to the classical field equation. So you, look at the small fluctuations around it. And this is the kind of analysis you do all the time in electromagnetism. These days, of course, you are, uh, uh, you, I'm sure you know that we can detect gravitational waves. And this is the way we analyze gravitational waves too. So you have some kind of complicated nonlinear field equation, but you first find the solution and you perturb around the solution and look at just the first order in this perturbation or fluctuation. And this is the process called linearization. So when you actually expand Psi, which is a complex field around this uh, uh, one solution V, which is the constant, then you need to introduce fluctuation both in the real part of the field and imaginary part of the field. And I apologize, I changed the notation from lecture notes. Uh, eventually I'm gonna edit the lecture notes to conform to the same notation later on. So phi is the real part, chi is the imaginary part. I just stick this into the oil Lagrange equation and I, I find this. So this is still not something I can solve on general grounds. 
But as I mentioned, like what we do in electromagnetism or uh, general relativity, we do linearization of the equation of motion, which is just a fancy way of saying that we only keep the first order terms and drop all the other high order terms. And that is justified when phi and chi are very small compared to V. And once you do so, this equation becomes drastically simpler. And the equation as a whole has, has both uh, uh, real parts and imaginary parts. So I separate real parts and imaginary parts, keeping only the first order terms in phi and chi. And that's how you end up with these two equations. Now you can see this is very simple. In addition, if you take another time derivative of this equation, phi double dot is then given by chi dot. But we know chi dot given in terms of phi. So I have a second order differential equation with phi only. I can eliminate chi. Then you sort of see what you get. So this is phi double dot over here. And this is chi dot. And using this equation, I get h bar <coughs> square root 2m twice. And I apologize, I made a mistake that I dropped the spatial derivative here. So I'm gonna fix this in lecture notes. So this is spatial derivative squared acting on it. So this is spatial derivative squared acting on here, spatial derivative squared acting also on here. So this is the h bar squared, spatial derivative squared over 2m, which you recognize as the form of the kinetic energy. And then chi is rewritten now by this. So big parentheses, kinetic energy phi minus two mu phi in there. So as a result, you know the dispersion relation, namely the relationship between wave vector and angular frequency, or by using h bar, momentum and energy. So now I express energy as a function of the momentum just by solving this classical Euler-Lagrange equation. So this is what we call the Bogolyubov spectrum, uh, namely that energy of the excitation is given in terms of the momentum of the excitation. And as you can see, when you send chemical potential to zero, then you can ignore this. This is square of the kinetic energy, p square over 2m, and then square root. So it's nothing but energy being p square over 2m. And that's what you would expect, right? On the other hand, when momentum is small, compared to the size of the chemical potential. Then you can ignore this term instead, second term in parentheses. So what you have is something that looks like k squared times mu square root. So after taking square root, this term will be proportional to k, so that's linear in momentum. And that actually turns out to be very important later on. So anyway, so uh, uh, I, let me pause here. If there are any questions about how you go about and just solve this equation simply by dropping all the high order terms, which comes with this fancy name of, of linearization. Any questions about that? Um, <clears throat> I might've missed this, but is this dispersion relation just obtained by solving um, the two differential equations on the side, you know, by taking the second derivative of uh, phi? And that's right, that's right. So where does the, I guess, the omega get introduced in h bar omega? So omega is the angular frequency. So once you write phi in the form of the plane wave, e to the minus i omega t, and mm -hmm. e to the i kx, this okay. phi double dot will pull out omega squared. I see. So here's a trial, a trial like standard plane wave solution. That's right, right. Makes sense. So because we did this linearization, the equation is linear, so you expect to have plane wave-like solution, and that's what you use as an ansatz, and as long as angular frequency and the wave vector satisfy this relationship, you do find the plane wave solution. Okay, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions here? Oh uh, yes, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the Ola Lagrange equation is the equation for precise, and precise the the annihilation operator, right? Right. But you assume like psi equals V plus phi plus I chi, and mm -hmm. three unknowns are or like right. real numbers. That's so right. are you assuming like 
the low energy excitation is still an eigenstate of the psi because otherwise you're using a number to represent the operator. That's an excellent question. And uh, uh, you know, the analysis using classical field theory is actually easy. But if you ask the question that you just asked, how that is actually shown in terms of Hilbert space and operators, it's a lot, a lot, a lot more complicated. And I actually, I don't intend to go through this in class, uh, but if you look at the lecture notes of boson.pdf, you find something called Bogolyubov transport, uh, transformation. So you first take uh, the coherent state as the ground state of the system, as I told you already. Then you're asking the question, what would be the excitations around that uh, uh, ground state? And then you write down the Hamiltonian, which includes this interaction term. So again, you cannot solve it exactly. So you try to solve it approximately. And the way you do it approximately is that looking at this Hamiltonian, you insert coherent state, namely constant psi, into two out of these psi diagram psi and keep the other two as operators. And that is actually the same idea as the linearization for the, uh, 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 the uh, equation of motion. Because if you only retain terms that are quadratic in psi and psi dagger, the corresponding Euler-Lagrange equation would be linear. But now using this language, you can deal with the operators. So you have Hamiltonian written as an operator, then you keep only quadratic pieces in operators psi and psi dagger, but replace the less rest by the eigenvalue in the coherent state. So then you have a quadratic Hamiltonian. But that Hamiltonian looks very weird. So this part is good. This is basically A dagger A, creation annihilation operators, A dagger A, so far so good. But if you replace two psi daggers by number and keep two psi's in it, now you have a term in the Hamiltonian that looks like A, A, not A dagger A. You also have a term, A dagger, A dagger, if you replace psi by numbers. So you have this weird Hamiltonian, which is quadratic in A and A dagger, but in addition to A dagger A terms we're used to, you also have A, A in A dagger, A dagger terms in it. But within this approximation, you can still diagonalize the Hamiltonian by doing this Bogobliov transformation, where, again, this is weird, you take linear combination of creation operator and annihilation operator. Then you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And that sounds totally crazy because creation operator increases the number, annihilation operator decreases the number. What the heck does it mean to take linear superpositions of them? But now that we are dealing with a coherent state where number is uncertain, the state you start out with for the ground state has some distribution in numbers already. So starting from this state, creation and annihilation can lead to the same state at the end of the day. So that's the real thing you have to do, which is far more technical than what I do on the slides. And what you can do that, and you indeed arrive at exactly the same answer at the end of the day of this Bogoliva spectrum. So one advantage you see in this exercise is that looking at the classical field equation is a lot easier than dealing with the operators and trying to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, but you get the same answer. And that's the advantage of looking at this Bose-Einstein condensate as a limit of classical wave coming out of QFT, which justifies this very simple analysis you can do on a single page of paper to obtain this uh, non-trivial result of the Bogoliova spectrum. So that was an excellent question, Ryan. And, and did I answer your question? Uh, I think if I understand right, you, you just said we start from a coherent state so we can assume like psi and psi dagger to be a number. Then mm -hmm. you just like perturb it a little bit and the right. perturbation should be also enough. Okay, right. okay, I see. That's right. Thank you. And uh, the, is, is Reggie here? Maybe you want to actually uh, deal, uh, discuss this Bogolyubov transformation next Tuesday in discussion section. Yeah, that sounds good. <clears throat> okay, that'll be great. So don't miss that.
So you see that in action, how you actually use operators and, and do this bizarre linear combination between creation and relation operators to end up with the same result on this Bogorivo spectrum in discussion section. Okay, so this is the prediction. And just, just spend a minute to observe this again. Once you start with the Hamiltonian, of course, I made an approximation of the linearization, but there's no ambiguity in the, in the entire process. This is a inescapable prediction of this field theory. So whether your experimental result really shows this relationship between the energy and momentum of the excitation would be a very, very non-trivial test. There's no wiggle room. This is the prediction, and then we confront the data. And that's what people did in the end. And here's the data. This is the wave vector. So if you multiply h bar on top of it, that's the uh, uh, momentum. This is the angular frequency. So if you multiply h bar on top of it, that's the energy. And they, they are supposed to satisfy this Bogoliubo spectrum relationship. And that's the solid line. And black dots are the data. They're right on. Let me emphasize again, there's no wiggle room. You know the mass of the atom. The, the, uh, the, the, the only thing you don't know is the chemical potential. But in principle, you can predict that too. So chemical potential is related to the density by this uh, delta function potential lambda. And that's something you can measure too by doing a scattering experiment. What is the, uh, the strength of the repulsive force between the atoms? So once you fix that from measurement, and once you know the number density, you can work out what mu has to be, then there's zero parameter in this game. And that zero parameter prediction is completely consistent with the data points over this rather uh, long range of the wave vectors. So this is a very rigorous quantitative test that the field theory language we developed to study Bose-Einstein condensate really works. Okay, so let me pause here and see if there are any questions about this. Or well, just in case you want to know, this was done by Raman scattering, basically by injecting a photon and see how photon gets scattered with different energy and momentum at the end of the day. You can compute what is the energy and momentum of the excitation you created just by taking the energy and momentum difference between initial and final states of the photon. So energy and momentum conservation allows you to extract energy of the excitation created and momentum of the excitation you created and then you just plot them on this k omega plane. Okay, any questions? Okay, if there are none, let me just uh, uh, move ahead. And so that's one very, very important test of this uh, uh, field theory uh, describing bose einstein condensate. Now I'd like to also uh, talk about yet another exact solution you can come up with to this Euler-Lagrange equation. Suppose you put Bose-Einstein condensate into or onto a circle. You can imagine that you create a tube like this and put the Bose-Einstein condensate inside. So the whole point is that your condensate is now restricted on a circle with a finite radius and there's nothing inside. So condensate cannot be uh, at the center, has to be on this circle. So that's the situation uh, we have in mind. Then, obviously, it's a lot easier to deal with the polar coordinates, r and theta, instead of x and y. So I rewrite this Euler-Lagrange equation using polar coordinates. So this derivative squared is now written by R, uh, the second derivative with respect to R, and second derivative with respect to theta with one of R squared in front. So this is just a rewriting uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, Cartesian derivatives in terms of the polar coordinates. So there's nothing uh, 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 complicated here. And we are now saying is that bose einstein condensate is restricted on the circle with a finite radius R, so they are not allowed to move in our direction. So I drop this R derivative, right? 
And in addition, this psi, which is now a function of R and theta, R dependence is now fixed. So there's nothing we, we should solve for this. Theta dependence is what we need to solve for. But clearly, in this theta direction, the polar angle, when the polar angle goes around the circle by 2 pi, then psi has to come back to where it was. Namely, that psi should satisfy the periodic boundary condition in the polar angle direction. So if you add 2 pi to the polar angle, then it should return to the same uh, 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 the field psi. Once we know this, you can just go ahead and solve this equation, it turns out. So what we do is to take the modulus of psi so that the last two terms cancel against each other. And then you make sure that theta dependence and time dependence of psi would balance this term against this term. And that's also easy to do. So this is a solution. It's a familiar factor by now, square root of mu over lambda, that corresponds to the square root of the number density, right? And then you have theta dependence. And because theta dependence has to be periodic, all it can be is e to the i n theta, where n is an integer. So that's basically the Fourier modes. And once you know the theta dependence with this integer n, you know what you get from this. And you're supposed to get the same thing from time derivative. So that fixes the time dependence to this value. And I apologize, I forgot n squared in it. So h bar squared n squared over 2m r squared is the coefficient of t over h in the exponent. So now you have an exact solution. An exact solution is now labeled by picking an integer. It can be positive or negative, just any integer, but it can't be a fractional number or irrational number. It can't be 3.14. It can't be 2 from pi. It has to be 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, minus 2, minus 3. It has to be an integer. And once you have psi, you can compute the current, which is basically the same thing as saying you use momentum, which is h bar derivative over 2m, but now written in terms of polar coordinates. So this is theta derivative is 1 over r in front. And you use this psi as a classical wave and compute the current of this classical wave by this expression. And that turns out to be very simple. And this mu over lambda, again, is a number density. To avoid the clash of notation with n as an integer, I used rho to represent the number density. And the rest is the velocity. The current has to be the same as the uh, number density times the velocity field. That's what we do in fluid mechanics. So now you can com uh, compute the velocity, which is given by 2h bar over mr in theta direction. And this allows you to compute an, a quantity called circulation in fluid mechanics. This is the velocity. When velocity actually goes around this ring, then you just integrate this velocity around this entire ring. And that's the definition of the circulation. So you just plug in this velocity into this definition. And dx is nothing but r d theta along this ring. r cancels. And d theta gives you 2 pi. 2 pi times h bar is h. So what do you find in the end is this circulation is quantized. So circulation is basically measures how much flow is going on inside this ring. And but this flow is quantized in the unit of h over m. That's the quantum sort of circulation. And the flow of the both action condensate inside the ring has to be integer multiple of this. Now we are seeing, seeing something really strange. We are dealing with classical field theory. But now you see quantization condition of the circulation of the fluid. And of course, in some sense, this is nothing surprising. Even in classical field theory, like in electromagnetism, once you put, for example, the electromagnetic field inside a cavity, you have boundary conditions. And then the frequencies and wave vectors become quantized. So in some sense, this is the same phenomenon. 
In classical field theory, with given boundary conditions, you see only discrete modes present in the solutions of the system. So what we are doing here is the same thing. But from the point of view of atoms, this is a very surprising result. You have these thousands and millions of atoms flowing inside this tube. But the velocity this fluid can have comes with the integer multiple of certain quantum unit. That is more surprising. So from the point of view of classical field theory, getting this kind of quantization is not too surprising because they are basically resonant modes inside a cavity and stuff like this. But from the point of view of individual particles, this is surprising because the particles are allowed to flow in the velocity only in some discrete units. Current inside this tube is quantized and that's a prediction we get from this classical field theory. But it's a very surprising result if you go back and think of this as a system of macroscopic number of atoms. But that's the, the prediction again. Any questions about this discussion here? Uh, I just had a question on where do you get the quantization of n in the, the uh, solution uh, of psi? n? Yeah, this is just because of the periodic boundary condition. Oh, so, okay. yeah, so mm -hmm. if you go around the circle, then psi has to come back the way it started with. And that's why theta dependence always need to come with as an integer. And that can't be one and a half or minus 2.4. It has to be an integer. Okay. okay. Makes sense. So that's the boundary condition in this system uh, using this anal analogy to the cavity electromagnetism. Any further questions? No? Okay, so now the flow of this boson condensate inside this tube is quantized in this unit of the circulation. More surprising thing, and, and uh, uh, you can uh, deduce from this, is the following fact. There has to be a persistent flow. And what it means is, is that suppose you already have the flow with this N being two. So you have twice the quantum circulation. So suppose you have a Bose-Einstein condensate of that sort. What you do is to first produce this potential trap so that fluid can be around this center, but not at the center. And this is the situation that would sort of realize the tube uh, in an ideal setting I talked about on a previous slide, but this is something you can do experimentally. So this is the sort of the, the, uh, the best you can come up with which corresponds to the tube on the previous slide. And you can indeed trap a Bose-Einstein condensate uh, in, at the bottom of this potential. So this is the tube. And suppose you created Bose-Einstein condensate with N being two. And N would correspond to the kinetic energy, which is N squared. So that's, that's what I forgot to write here. So N squared is the kinetic energy. So the larger the N is, you have higher energy. So you would think that if you start out with a boson condensate of n being two, you will probably decay to n equal one. And indeed that can happen, but you can't go in between. N has to go from two to one without decreasing two to one, but rather has to jump because n has to be an integer. It can't be one and a half. It can be 1.97. So you have to jump from two to one which basically corresponds to a tunneling process. So just like you have a potential barrier between two states, you can hop over classically because you don't have energy for it. You have to tunnel through it. Then the tunneling process is exponentially suppressed in terms of its weight. And that's a WKB approximation you might have heard of in the quantum mechanics class. I, I, actually, I don't know. Have you, have you studied the WKB? Okay, good, good. So the tunneling process is always exponentially suppressed because of this. And exponential suppression, what the exponent in this case is proportional to number of particles you have in the system. So it's actually quite a bit suppressed. So it doesn't happen very quickly. So once you actually trap the system along this bottom of this potential in a circle with n greater than one, it will stay with that number for some long time. 
So sort of the, uh, the idealization is what is called a persistent flow. Of course, that's really idealization. It doesn't last forever, but it can last at least for a long time. And this is an example of the phrase you might have heard of, especially in condensed matter physics, called topologically protected state. N is an integer. And this has to do with something called topological invariance. And so N being an integer doesn't allow you to go from smoothly from two to one, one to zero. You have to make a jump. And the jump is always exponentially suppressed. Therefore, this state is protected and it can survive for a long time. And that's the feature called topological protection. So this is one example of topologically protected state, which you may hear about in, especially in condensed matter physics, but same ideas also appear in particle physics, cosmology, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, this is the first example where I see this uh, topological protection on a quantum state. So let's look at how long they survive on the next slide. And we can come back and talk about this conceptual idea uh, after this. So this is the plot. So if you have a flow with n equals zero, that's the normal Bose-Einstein condensate, you know, you actually lose it fairly quickly within a, a few seconds. And the, the reason being that inside this Bose-Einstein condensate, let's say you have two atoms scattering against each other, but you have, we have already taken care of in our Lagrangian, this lambda psi 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 dag of psi dag of psi psi term is this two body reaction between two atoms. So we have taken care of that already. But very rarely, maybe three atoms come together. When three atoms come together, two of them might decide to stick and form a molecule by releasing energy by kicking out the third one. Then your gas of atoms start to look different by forming these clusters of molecules in it. And that's how you actually lose the system. And that's why we have to make the gas very dilute. And that's why we require this incredibly low temperature to start with. So it would eventually, you know, disappear. The both actually condensate don't live forever because of that. So ordinary BEC doesn't last very long. But if you have this BEC flowing at the bottom of this tube with a finite N, it stays that way much longer. And that's an evidence of this topologically protected state. It's not persistent, that's an exaggeration, I have to say but it's definitely long lived compared to a typical Bose-Einstein condensate by almost an order of magnitude. So the fact that this fluid of Bose-Einstein condensate flowing inside this tube is characterized by integers, not real number, not fraction number, but integers, they come in discrete steps, provides a protection for this state to last long compared to the state without the protection. So that's an experimental evidence of this topological protection. Okay, so any questions about this concept over here? And you'll see more examples of this uh, as we go on. So hopefully you get used to it at the end of the day. This is the first time you see this idea of topological protection. Uh, so uh, I, I pause for questions. Uh, how exactly does the exponential suppression arise? Uh, from this quantization? Yeah, so the, because n cannot be between one and two, it's, it's, it's basically the same thing as having a big potential that you can't be in between. So that's an analogy, which I can justify more clearly once I actually uh, do this a field theory calculation of it. And I don't do this in class, but uh, it's something you can try. So even in field theory, you can ask the question how you can tunnel from state two to state one through a potential barrier. And the tunneling process is something you can compute with WKB approximation. Mm -hmm. And you have learned that WKB approximation gives you exponentially suppressed amplitude where exponent is given by X integral of P over H bar. So yeah. that's the exponential suppression. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes okay. sense. Right, any further questions on this? Okay, is this okay too? All right, so now you see many, many predictions can be derived out of just simple 
classical Euler Lagrange equation. We have not touched any operators in all of these discussions, but we could work out the excitation spectrum in Bogorio spectrum, which really agrees with the experiment data extremely well. We could also derive this topological protection of a flow uh, along the circle, and we could actually uh, 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 verify that experimentally as well. Now I you can ask the following question. So you have now this potential where the, the, uh, the Bose-Einstein constant is flowing at the bottom of this potential. Suppose you remove it, what happens to it? Clearly, something is going around. There is an angular momentum associated with this state. And angular momentum is conserved. So you are supposed to get something non-trivial, even after we, you remove the potential. And that is actually a vortex of the fluid. So quantum vortex is actually a little bit complicated. And you solve the Euler-Lagrange equation we have done before. Oops. And you find a solution that looks like this. This phi, I'm sorry, I borrowed this slide from some, some, some other lectures, so I haven't had actually time to correct this. So this phi is meant to be the same thing as psi, I apologize. And psi at the spatial infinity would approach square root of mu over lambda. That's the ground state value of psi. But I can force this psi to have this phase factor we have seen on the previous slide, e to the i theta. It can be e to the two i theta, three i theta, minus i theta, but e to the i theta times integer. Here I'm looking at the simplest case with uh, integer being one. And this v is the square root of mu over lambda. That's this asymptotic value. And, and so this is the situation you would see once you remove the potential out of that tube, right? So you have this e to the i theta behavior. But now that the, the potential is removed, this fluid can also be the, at the origin. But at the origin in a polar coordinate, theta is ill-defined. So the only thing, only way you can make everything consistent is to force this psi to go to zero at the origin so that you don't have this multivalued function. So it's still single valued. So even though there's e to the i theta here, it just psi vanishes at the origin. Then you can interpolate between zero and the ground state value for the modulus of psi from the origin to infinity, which unfortunately you cannot do analytically because of this nonlinear nature of the field equation, but you can do it numerically. And that's what I have done with the Mathematica. So it, it's a smooth interpolation between zero and this uh, ground state value. But interesting thing is that, again, because of this e to the i theta factor, when you compute the current, then it looks like this. It really does show that there's something going around, right? And that's the vortex. So you have a Bose-Einstein condensate. And if you actually produce a Bose-Einstein condensate, and you can rotate the system, then it starts to flow like this. But remember, the circulation around the origin is still the same quantum, n times h over m. That hasn't changed. So you can create a situation of a condensate with an overall rotation, which requires the condensate to vanish at the origin. And that's the vortex solution. Again, I can show the solution analytically, but I can show the solution numerically. And this is indeed the, uh, uh, the velocity field looks like. And the question is, can, we, can you really see this in experiment? And the answer, of course, is yes. This is a Bose-Einstein condensate with one vortex in it. This is a, a, a Bose-Einstein condensate with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vortices in it. It turns out that vortices would repel each other. They don't want to be as, uh, they want to be as far as away from each other. And when you have this plane where you have things that repel each other to keep the maximum distance from each other, the best arrangement 
would be a triangular lattice. So you end up having this triangular lattice of vortices with higher and higher angular momenta of the Bose-Einstein condensate. And that's something you can create experimentally and observe like this. And you see these blue dots because this is where the condensate vanishes. Number density go to zero at the center of these vortices. So it's sort of like a hurricane and these blue dots are the eyes of the hurricane, right? So everything goes around it. The center is a special place. So in the case of bose einstein condensate, centers of the hurricane are special places where the size of the condensate vanishes. Number density goes to zero so that the theta becomes uh, uh, well uh, doesn't cause any ill-defined uh, 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 ill defined uh, feature of this field psi. So this is the way just the classical solution to Euler-Lagrange equation led to so many different predictions by now. Bogoliu spectrum, quantized circulation in the, uh, in the uh, donut-shaped uh, ring, and also rotating Bose-Einstein condensate that leads to the triangular lattice of vortices. And all of these things follow from the single classical Euler-Lagrange equation. And so this is really a demonstration, set of demonstrations where classical wave is the right description for the Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, let me stop here and pause for any questions. These are beautiful pictures, but I think this is better to look at. And just in case you're also wondering what the heck is the symbol over here, this is the way you actually analyze what is called algebraic topology. So these things are topologically protected. Again, there's some language mathematicians use to understand the topology of these things, which is parameterized by the integer. And uh, the, it turns out that this is described by the same kind of topology when you take a, a rubber band and put that on the bottleneck. And rubber band corresponds to the infinity of space. And the bottleneck corresponds to the phase of this field. And when you take the rubber band and, and put that n times over the bottleneck, that is what corresponds to e to the n i theta because spatial infinity would wrap around the phase of this field psi n times. And this is what mathematicians study as a map from one dimensional circle to another one dimensional circle. The first one dimensional circle is spatial infinity. Another one dimensional circle is just this phase of this uh, field. And writing this, uh, the, 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 the field as a function of spatial coordinate is nothing but a mapping from spatial infinity to the phase of this field. And hence, it's the same problem as the rubber band wrapping around the bottleneck. And that is what mathematicians say by writing down this funny symbol that this pi one is meant to be how many times you wrap around this rubber band on the bottleneck or phase of this field. And that is parameterized by the integer. It's such a trivial statement but this is the mathematical equations they use to represent that fact. So if you don't care about this algebraic topology, don't worry about it. We are not relying on this. We can still rely on this, 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 this intuition that when you go around space, you wrap around the phase of this field integer times. And it has to be integer because you have to come back to the same psi uh, at the end of the day. So theta going to two pi gives you periodic boundary condition. And this is just a fancy way of expressing that. So any questions about this vortex solution? Anna wants to speak, yeah. Yeah, um, so I guess, so this solution comes about like after we've created the previous like the topologically protected state and then we remove the kind of toroidal potential that we've created? Yeah, so there's definitely, that's definitely one way to do it. It turns okay. out that you can also do a similar thing with an actual bucket. And so far we talked about the gas of cold atoms, but it turns out that the low temperature uh, liquid helium-4 would also exhibit the same behavior. It turns out that that is a superfluid 
you might have done exp experiment in a lab with a superfluid, I don't know. Uh, so the superfluid of liquid helium-4 can be described by the same machinery, it turns out. So in that case, you have a bucket and you fill it with a liquid helium. You cool it below the critical temperature of the limit and become the superfluid. And you literally rotate the bucket and that would lead to the vortices as well. And I don't think I have time to finish that discussion today, so let me just flash a picture of it and then uh, discuss it actually on, on, on next week. So this is the lattice of vortices of liquid helium, and you literally rotate the bucket, and depending on how much you rotate the bucket, you start to produce one vortex, two vortices, three vortices, four vortices, and so on and so forth. And again, they all lined up neatly in triangular lattice. So that's another way of producing this lattice of vortices. Okay, so let me stop here and I can pose four more questions. And uh, the, uh, the, the lecture is over. Questions? Uh, may I ask another question? Go ahead. So, so the take home message should be like, uh, uh, the vertices carry angular momentum, or right. uh, if the BEC has uh, angular momentum, it should have vertices, right? Right. So okay, so so the whole argument doesn't care. I mean, doesn't care about the lambda equals zero or not, like you, like ah. the hook you give. Yeah, that, that's an excellent the question. So the there's something special about the lambda being the the repulsive interaction. And I meant to talk about this, but I didn't get to it. So you can ask the question, what if you change lambda? And once you actually change the lambda from positive to zero and negative, this potential I talked about, this is the potential of the field or Hamiltonian as a function of psi, with this shape to that shape. Then you can immediately see, you know, this would lead to a stable, Sorry. And I, I'm gonna actually talk about this again next week because we didn't get to it. But just, just for those of you who are still hanging out here. So this would drop to the stable uh, uh, minimum. That's the, this one. But when lambda is a, a, a negative, when you have the attractive interaction among the atoms, certainly this starts to drop indefinitely on this potential. So the field psi would eventually go to infinity, which means that density goes to infinity. In other words, the Bose-Einstein condensate would collapse to a point where the density becomes infinite. So it's an implosion of Bose-Einstein condensate. And you can do this experimentally, it turns out. So in some atomic systems, you can change the repulsive interaction to attractive interaction by dialing the magnetic field acting on the atoms. So you go from repulsive interaction to an attractive uh, uh, interaction by, by uh, turning a dial on, on the apparatus. And then indeed the system implodes. It collapses to a point. And after it implodes, then there's a, a bounce that whole thing starts to explode, and that's this movie. And it's called Bose Nova, and that's a joke. You know, you might know of a supernova. That's an explosion of a star that led to the discovery of dark energy by Sol Perlmutter, one of our colleagues. So instead of a supernova, that's an explosion of a macroscopic star, we are talking about a Bose Nova, which is the explosion of this tiny Bose-Einstein condensate, and that's what you can see here. By turning the dial, Bose-Einstein condensate first implodes, and the envelope bounces back in this explosion, and that's the Bose nova. So the sign of lambda, as you said, has a very important role in all of this business. Okay, I see, I see, thank you. And I have another question, can I still do? Okay, so in type two superconductors, we know we can also have vertices because the magnetic field can penetrate through the superconductor. But uh, does that mean the superconductor has like angular momentum? 
I, I don't see anything like floating inside the superconductor. It, it is flowing, inside. actually. Yeah, in, also in, in a superconductor, when you have this uh, the flux tube, then the, there is a supercurrent going around it. And that's something you can understand from classical field equation again, and we will talk about this. So in order to have the magnetic field trapped in a tube like this, you can use Ampere's law that the current going around it should correspond to the magnetic flux going through it. So if you have a trapped magnetic field in a superconductor, there has to be a current around it. And that is a supercurrent, which is the anal analog of this uh, circulation in the bose einstein condensate we talked about. So bose einstein condensate is superfluid, and once superfluid carries electric charge, that is the case of superconductor, then it becomes a superconductor where you expect to have electric current flowing in a persistent way, again, topologically protected, and hence the supercurrent with zero resistivity. So we will talk about that. Okay, I see. Any other Thank questions you. on this? I just had a very quick question on the formation of the vortices. So okay. it, it, it's a result of the conservation of angular momentum, and that's either by uh, acting on like a torque or rotation in the superfluid helium case mm -hmm. or moving mm -hmm. potential. So those are like two different ways of forming these vortices. Right, right, that's right. So you can first form a boson condensate with this kind of trap. And if it has, happens to be circulating already, just removing the trap would lead to this set of vortices. Or you first form the Bosanian condensate and find a way of exerting a torque on it to, to make, make uh, the force it to start to rotate. Either way is fine. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. Any further questions on this? Okay, then let me stop here and uh, the, I will post a new homework problem where you actually deal with these classical solutions to the Lagrange equation. And uh, uh, yeah, we go from there. See you next week. Uh, thank you. Bye. Yeah, thanks.